Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I confess that uh, I'll admit that my job uh, editing and publishing the Sewanee Review is extremely fun. This may be uh, the most fun part of the job to invite, uh, well, well, first to, of course, FET to honor uh, a, a great poet, but then also to bring in a great critic uh, to talk about that poet's work. Um, Dan Chasen might be America's most visible poetry critic. Having written regularly for The New Yorker since 2000, his clear, intelligent prose is a touchstone for the reading public. He has written definitively on some of the greatest poets of the last century. His 2007 book, One, of a, One Kind of Everything, investigates the autobiographical impulse in the works of Robert Lowell, Frank Bedart, Louise, Louis, Louis Glick, uh, Elizabeth Bishop, and Frank O'Hara, among others. Chasen is also a devoted champion of contemporary writers. A 2017 review of Dinez Smith's dazzling new collection, Don't Call Us Dead, was nothing short of career making for the young poet. It is far from hyperbole to say that Chasen's criticism has helped keep poetry alive in the world of American letters. In addition to his work at The New Yorker, Chasen has been poetry editor at the Paris Review and a regular contributor to the New York Review of Books. He is also a professor of English at Wellesley College, a position he has held for over a decade. His career has been recognized with numerous literary honors, including a Whiting Award and a Guggenheim Fellowship, both for poetry. Chasen's poetic output totals four collections, the most recent being 2014's Bicentennial. His poems investigate the possibilities of imagination with economy and charm. The poem Train from his 20, 2011 collection, Where's the Moon, There's the Moon, is typical of this endeavor. Imagining a boxcar traveling to Boston, its speaker admits to the objective limits of imagination. You can follow the train in your mind, but your mind cannot follow the train. To Chasen, imagination is a means of perception, a quality he shares with the subject of this lecture, Heather McGew. And I'll just go off script brief briefly to say that uh, it was wonderful to make contact with Dan uh, as, as a fan of his, but I was even more excited when I told him who we'd be honoring this year um, with the Aiken Taylor Award, and Dan said, I've been wanting to write about McGew for a long time. And so that's what you'll hear. Dan Chase. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, it's amazing. It's an honor to be here. If you spend a lot of time reading modern poetry, obviously you spend a lot of time imagining Suwannee. And um, in my case, somewhat accurately, it's just as beautiful and um, kind of eerie and mysterious as I had imagined. And um, it's wonderful to be here. Um, it's great to be here to celebrate Heather McHugh, one of my very favorite poets uh, for several decades now. And weirdly, I've just never had an opportunity to write about her. Um, when Upgraded to Serious came out in 2009, I was busy with little kids, and I just didn't, uh, I, you know, I wasn't looking around in the way that I should have, but I re regretted it ever since. And so here's my opportunity to make amends. Um, I want to thank Adam, um, a great host. I just met him yesterday, but I feel like I've known him my whole life. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> this is the bar. Uh, and everybody at the review, uh, Alec, um, Annie. My wife is also named Annie Adams, so I, this is the, yeah. Most Annie Adamses uh, fell overboard on the Arabella, uh, but the few survivors, <laughs> the few survivors, uh, uh, um, as well as Walt uh, and Spencer, and uh, just the, to watch the review come to life in this way has been astounding. I've been watching it beginning with that wonderful piece on um, Adam that ran in the Times a couple of years ago. And um, now it's become, again, one of the central places uh, in American literature, I think, contemporary American literature. So without further ado, you have a handout. Um, 
These are poems that I quote at length and in some cases in full, so you, I will sort of cue you to look at them when I get to those poems. The title of my talk is For Membering Heather McHugh, and um, I'm not going to tell you what I mean by that until the end. Um, so it's like Citizen Kane, you know, you, 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 you find out um, <clears throat> For Membering Heather McHugh. F, I spelled the way you spelled it, F-O-R-E-M-E-M-B-E-R-I-N-G. <laughs> the job of the critic is not made easier by standing before his subject, presuming to know what to say about her to her. You could argue that a person becomes a critic, building a self out of words to substitute for the flesh and blood person, and in order to face another word-made self, his subject on his own terms, on his own turf, in fact. Face is an important word here. A work of criticism is a kind of verbal face, from the Latin facio to make. A face is a fiction, also from facio. A made-up thing, a fashioned thing. When you read a lot of McHugh, you start looking into words, hanging around them, asking questions about their backgrounds. No less is a poem a kind of face constructed from verbal features. These two faces could be said to be constructed with one another in mind. Eliot's line, a face to meet the faces that you meet, suggests the paradoxes here. Poems could be said to be made according to their internalized sense of possible critical response or reception. Criticism, of course, is made partly to reflect back upon the expressions manifested by poems. All of this is to say poems and works of criticism already face one another. When their authors show up in person, another interesting word in this context, person from persona, an actor's mask, it's like, forgive me, it's a little like Parents' Weekend, the complex ratios of claiming and disowning, the previously free and easy offspring suddenly crowded by its creator, who regards it with pride, pity, or embarrassment, aware that he is straight into territory not properly his, and real-time adjusting his own attitude towards his work. The situation is not ameliorated by the fact that my subject is Heather McHugh, a writer whose own criticism has meant so much to me over the years, almost as much as her poems, and whose poems are so fantastically responsive to themselves that they are their own truest and most reliable guide. Ideally, in my circumstance, the author of one of the essential bodies of poems in contemporary American literature would never have thought about what she might have meant by those poems or how and why she made them. My words would then be as light in darkness, a revelation, the first wary steps, astonished steps outside the structure built by her hand, brick by brick, that had a lack closed in around her. This is not the current case." McHugh has written brilliantly about her work and about the art of poetry in general. In interviews, she is unfailingly incisive and weirdly non-possessive about her poems, grateful as though they were given to her, curious as though they were creatures in nature, their features wonderful and strange, perhaps a little comical, appreciative that they give evidence of the larger marvels and that their adaptations necessary for survival manifest as beauty. Uh, but here is where it helps to greet a writer face to face or to behold her meeting others as in a fine interview with Seattle Voices I viewed while preparing to write these remarks. Parenthetically, would one say this morning or last week? A point about time I will return to in a moment, a point McHugh's poems force us to confront. You can find the interview on YouTube. McHugh sits at a round table, amiably, winningly fielding her interviewers' thoughtful questions, surprising herself by a choice of word or inflection, running down interpretive leads, and then pivoting forcefully to some new possibility. The brilliance concentrated in the poems is not hoarded there. A command performance, and I would suspect nothing in it recycled from any prior formulation. One of the challenges in writing about McHugh, which I will address in a moment, is that she brings a fresh attack to every poem. Not that she doesn't have themes and preoccupations and so on, but that they tend to exist to be undermined by entirely novel actions of mind. 
Here's an exchange from the interview. This is McHugh speaking. The natural world is so rich with figures for responsiveness. The enormous whale screening huge volumes of water to get krill, plankton, as the nourishment for the largest animal. There are so many things I resisted as a kid, among them the dimension of proportion that was imposed upon us by a sort of human chauvinism. It was just a quirk of where our eyes were stuck in our heads. Everything, wavelengths of sound, were just quirks of having two ears. We were just schmucks with two ears. Time drove me crazy. I couldn't learn time. I was an idiot child by many standards. I just didn't want them putting that imprint on my head. The hardiness of this performance, its delight in its own robust responsiveness and riches of figure and phrase, recalls to me Emily Dickinson's own little arias of introduction in her letters to Colonel Higginson. For Dickinson, as for McHugh, any thorough accounting a person might make of herself must include the history of her consciousness of her body in space and time. These moments she felt, sorry, those moments she felt small, large, central, or peripheral, when in time she felt herself to be ahead or behind, early or late. My business is circumference, Dickinson writes, suggesting how often she operates most economically at the farthest fringe of her senses. The cause and also the consequence of this talent for the far away is also suggested in a letter to Higginson, quote, the mind is so near itself. McHugh's version from a poem I'll discuss a little more later, 2200 on 747 is, quote, the here and now is clear, I mean, so we can't see it. This is the confusion of near and far, the estrangement or blurriness or deadness of the near compared to the supernatural vividness and clarity of the distant. In another letter, Dickinson writes of, quote, springing to the window where I saw a caterpillar measure a leaf far down in the orchard. Dickinson can see a thing too tiny and too far to see, paradoxically, precisely because it is circumferential. And what is happening on the very edge of her perception, the creature measuring a leaf is testing its own relationship to space, expanding fractionally in our frame, though enormously in its own, the bounds of the circle. Quote, time drove me crazy. I couldn't learn time. McHugh tells her interviewer. Just so Dickinson to Higginson, I never knew how to tell the time by the clock until I was 15. My father thought he had taught me, but I did not understand, and I was afraid to say I did not, and afraid to ask anyone else lest he should know. How strange and marvelous and poignant to make the confession in the past tense. A writer who misunderstands or cannot learn time or the time by the clock, is native to its proper and deeper manifestations. The clock becomes thereby partly a vehicle for ironies. At half past three, a single bird, Dickinson writes, or the birds begun at four o'clock their period for dawn. I'm quoting Dickinson now. I could not count their force. Their voices did expend as brook by brook bestows itself to multiply the pond. The individual voices flowing into the dawn chorus create it and are obliterated by it, like the brooks which, when they, quote, bestow themselves to the pond, join the pond, multiply the pond as an act of self-annihilation. Clock time is useful as the steady backbeat against which nature's improvisations gather speed and finesse and volume. The poet like a pilot monitoring multiple gauges, notes the discrepancies and deviations from level. First bird at 3.30, first bird at 4, first bird at 5. When I was a student at Amherst College in a squalid dorm room whose only perk was a view of Dickinson's pines, I used to wait, I used to wait very early in the spring for these predictions, which are also, of course, recollections, to come true. If the first bird was at 3.30, it was sometime in late May. If you gather enough data, you see, you can rebuild the clock and the calendar that so many of Dickinson's poems and so many of McHugh's poems deconstruct. It is in a way comical and also, in a way, my point that McHugh, the poet, 
has written more succinctly and precisely about her poems, declaring her own debts even while capitalizing upon them than I, currently the critic, ever could. When you look at that interview with Seattle Voices, I suspect you'll see the problem. McHugh's voice in poems, in essays, in person is both in and out of the game, as Whitman writes, a pundit and a player, a game where, in fact, the two roles cannot finally be distinguished. What is it like to be a professor, her interviewer asks. The answer, as usual in McHugh, precedes the question. This is, in fact, from the opening of her essay on Dickinson. Profession is itself a prison, unless or until it can say so, that is, investigate its own opposite, say, confession. The professor is trapped in the terms of her work, in the roots, i.e., the ends of terms themselves. Subject and object change places in the first person, and as William James so mercilessly put it, the natural enemy of any subject is the professor thereof. James likely did not intend, but, but McHugh does intend the pun on subject. This is the standoff between expertise and wonder, clock time and bird time, the self organized around stable points of reference or regular patterns of recurrence. I'm married, I'm a parent, I'm this or that age, the following events have shaped me. And a more potent, indeed more dangerous self that we find throughout McHugh's work, diffused, extended, expanded at its fringe by a sentience operating like a drone, far away from its operator, between the, quote, imprint of received assumptions and the riot of counter-evidence coming in through the senses, what, me, what McHugh calls variously, what McHugh calls in the interview, scintillance. This contest is, for me, the defining feature of her poems, and it makes her unique, impossible to categorize. She is a border that crosses itself to lift a line from one of her poems. She is neither confessional nor professional, to steal her terms. Her work is generally seen as difficult, which places her in a line of poets. It also simultaneously distinguishes her very sharply from. Any classification would, I think, have this effect. She is an outlier by instinct, moving reflexively away from habits she senses coalescing in the moment. <clears throat> it is not a surprise that she finds in William James, a compatriot, James who called himself, quote, a zigzag sort of person, moving into and out of positions, beliefs, and painfully moods. The occasions of McHugh's self-estrangement are often daily fodder. So now I'm going to refer to a poem called Missing Meaning, which is there. Uh, I'm going to read, the, I think, the entire thing, but you can just consult it if you'd like. <clears throat> in Missing Meaning, she, so in some of these cases, I make assumptions about the sort of narrative behind the poems. And when one does that, one is always embarrassingly wrong. <laughs> but I'm okay being corrected. So this is my presumption about what episode or event is happening behind the poem. In Missing Meaning, she takes off her glasses and puts on a Viewmaster headset. Here's the poem. The mystery of speaking every day so plainly from a face she cannot see unsettles her unless she can forget the things she knows and sink back into what she means. Her times seem over-focused on the frame, wire-rimmed or tortoise shell, and nothing taken at face value. The skeptic backs his watch, watches his back, that much is given. But the view masters skewed by a hairbreadth or eye bridge, there goes heaven. The poem's first insight is a sublime one. We speak when we speak out of faces, not mere mouths. Faces whose appearance is largely beyond our control. One of the reasons writers are so odd in person is that they are used to expressing themselves from a face entirely within their design. This is why people worry about their frames and not their focus, or brilliantly, they, quote, over-focus on the frame. It's one of the few facial variables we can really manage. McHugh's toggling between the self as subject and the self as an object, seeing as a thing seen, is everywhere rapid and surprising. Missing Meaning is a poem about vision trouble, in part, in part, and its magnificent blur begins with its title, 
two identically weighted words, almost to the naked eye mirror images. If we were imagining a fulcrum between them, they would sit level upon it, the way a pair of glasses or a viewmaster would sit upon the bridge of your nose. This sort, of sym- this sort of symmetry is the poem's formal principle. Its couplets, some of them more balanced than others, suggesting the precarious, tippy equilibrium between self and world, seeing and being seen, backing your watch and watching your back. And yet nothing in this poem tidily resolves into, quote, meaning. Its own meaning, you could say, is missing, though only by a hairbreadth. I initially read it as a poem about preferring our virtual worlds to the actual one, the viewmaster to the glasses. But of course, both, both technologies are necessary. The protagonist, our she, the choice of pronoun itself important in a poem about the trickiness of self-regard, blind as to the near and the far, has her views skewed by the eye bridge of her glasses. The meaning in missing meaning is itself meaning is itself missing if by meaning we mean some pearl we can extract from it and discard the shell but we don't miss meanings unless we suspect that they're there or were there or might be there McHugh is a poet wonderfully of recognizable contemporary life and language incorporated into her poems only to be estranged the way a chef might transform some very pedestrian ingredient pickle relish or chicken pucks, right up to without crossing the point where it becomes impossible to spot. The poems are themselves just this way, approaching parable or maxim only to dissolve into contradiction. If a definition poem, ambiguous. If a riddle, half solvable. If a moral fable, one that gets tangled up in its own terms. Missing meanings, missing meaning. But in the space bar in McHugh's poem of that name, one of many that discover keyboards in the world to reflect the world on her keyboard, we find, quote, the meaning of it all in, quote, the vessels marked with letters, numbers, signs behind, quote, the space bartender. Do you have this poem? I... Yeah. Okay, yeah. thanks. So <clears throat> you can take a minute to read it through. Its final stanza is one of my favorite casual expressions of McHugh's rigorous metaphysics. I have killed, she writes, many happy hours, or many happy hours here, with my bare hands as TV passes for IV among the space cadets and dingbats. We kill many happy hours by dwelling upon loss, the poet's great subject. We also kill many happy hours by showing up for cut-rate drinks. A TV passes for an IV to the lonely solo drinker or to the poet tapping distractedly when the words begin to flow. Dingbats are simpletons or ciphers, the nitwits and kooks you meet in an airport bar or on a keyboard where they transfer by their meaninglessness the kind of salty language you hear at a bar into a transcript that both does and does not represent it. Dingbats are, among other things, the asterisks and pound signs and so on used to represent obscenity in formal writing. In Space Bar, or Moving Walkway, a poem about grieving, ingeniously rendered as an ode to those level escalators in airports, Or Tree Farm, the named subject, is immediately estranged in ways that confound the distinctions between means and ends, vehicles and tenors, our imaginations, disposition toward the world, and the world itself. IV and TV, like DNA and the letters A and B, which to McHugh suggest by their profiles, man and woman, turn up in McHugh's poems as fully rendered material presences like a child's alphabet blocks. Medium hard riddles like these prepare us, if anything could, for McHugh's really flummoxing poems, where small advances lead as in a math problem from phrase to phrase and line to line. I want to look at one such poem as a way of returning to one of my initial claims, that McHugh, a great teacher of her own method, 
teaches us to read her poems in her poems. Curve, you have it, I think. <laughs> Curve seems to, me, seems to me one of McHugh's favorite words. I count a dozen or so uses in just the poems I happen to know offhand. The poem titled Curve is, I take it, partly about her predisposition for using the word, the bold curve, which curve itself cuts through her poems. Here it is. Freezeburn forms whirlpools and bare fur has curve. My line is gravity's sheer vertical. Memories the same seem. Sail a memo down. There's the spooled reel. Plunge into simulcast. Caught up in the network is a blue planet spinner par excellence. It's too small. Throw it back. It's important in this little barbed poem about fishing, not entirely to take the bait. Those, fa those failed casts in the first stanza only return the line to us. If you've ever fly fished, you know how typically you cast upstream and allow the fly to drift back to you, gradually reeling in the slack. And so the rhythm drives itself downward in strong dactyls, finally breaking itself off and surfacing in the second line as a spondy. Freeze burn and bear fur suggest all kinds of possibilities. I read them as decoys, like the fishing flies made from bear fur, amalgams designed for the moment both to attract and to confuse. I suspect the key to the poem is to keep not failing, sorry, I suspect the key to the poem is, not, is to keep not falling for the decoy, the language that almost resolves itself into radiant, radiant conceit also stops just short. A network is the net tangled up in the line and the lure, but it's also all the other things we associate with the word. Real, both is and is not real, R-E-E-L. Simulcasts represent in real or real time, a reality happening elsewhere. I suspect one of the images behind that tiny blue spinning planet at the end is the common sight on a computer screen of a little globe spinning as the browser, a little like a fisherman drawing from beneath the water its trophies, retrieves what it's been purposed to retrieve. If all of this makes us crave a, quote, throwback, it's partly because epiphany, insight, the catch, has been made in our current world too easy. A phrase reserved once for wonder, small world, must now be retrofitted for disappointment and ennui, too small. Spacebar, missing meaning, and curve are all poems about spatial disorientation, disequilibrium, sudden crisis, and opportunity within our relations to the world as we move through it. But I want to return, since I'm aware that my time is drawing short, to time, every poet's subject and medium. In McHugh's work, we find an apprehension of time, here as subject, there as medium, the shuttling between time as theme and time as vanishing oxygen or fuel for poetry. Remember what McHugh said in that interview, I couldn't learn time. One of McHugh's many great poems about dogs, spot in space and time, puts it succinctly, quote, between the looking forward and remembering, it's hard to find a moment for the present. Dogs, as everyone who has one knows, live in the moment, though we project pining and pathos onto them. <laughs> Part of the problem is defining what we mean by the present as it pertains to a work of verbal art. Trace resembles Elizabeth Bishop's famous poem, The Fish, I Caught a Tremendous Fish, in that the poem's arc ends when the arc of the action it describes also ends. Throw it back. Bishop writes, quote, I let the fish go. McHugh's imperative makes a difference. 
If you can synchronize the poem to the duration of an event, you also, in doing so, suggest the further syncing up of time between the reader and the author, both of whom, by necessity, end the poem at the same time, in the frame that contains them both. This is especially striking when an author reads herself, renewing every time she confronts it afresh, the work as a series of choices made in time, each one leading on to another. Curve, for example, the more exquisitely it locates itself in relation, upstream or down, big or small, to space, makes an indelible shape only by detonating its surprises, one after another, simultaneously building itself up and wearing itself away in time. Poems are circular, sending us back to their beginnings. Throw it back in poetry, as in fishing, often means starting over at the same spot, but with a new attack. McHugh's poems are rereadable and almost as a collateral benefit, remarkably memorable. Curve has its own say about memory. It's the same seam, the pun on seam with seam, S-E-E-M, suggesting how subsequent readings repay the effort they require. But as McHugh, a postmodern pre-Socratic, knows all too well, we never step twice into the same river. Nearing the end of the piece, I should throw it back and explain its title, For Membering Heather McHugh. The first disclosure is, I think it's a problematic title for this, for this speech, for reasons that have to do with the sheer number of associations unleashed by McHugh's portmanteau for member in some kind of pine, which you have. I take the poem to be her, maybe I'll just read, do you have it? Yeah, okay. Why don't I read it? Just, just for the pleasure of it. Some kind of pine. Mid-leap in her escape, the nymph is bushed. One hand bursts out in branches. Tropes turn helio. The hapless god has suffered some comeuppance too. He's stuck for good in his own stalking. The maker's a remarker, casting animal as vegetable, and then their motions turn to mineral. Their motions into monument. So now the downcast God puts forth forever in the villa's living room, preposterous, unsinkable, his best for member. There it is, a figurative branching toward her laurel literality. She can't in time escape. He can't in time arrive. They're caught for good in this ambiguous ambition one extending, one intending, never to be free. Right now, as I write now, one happenstance of courtyard, of, sorry, of courtyard tree appears attractively more little, literal than theirs, as yours, if you have one, must seem to you more literal than mine. By mine, I mean this actual and unpossessable midsummer something What's its name, this evergreen, beyond the hotel balcony, whose French doors, do they call them that in Italy? I flung wide open to escape my rectitude of narrow bedded room. The conifers outside confer a ringing down on everything, and water whooshes white around a bend. The branches glimmer at the tips. Are they some kind of pine? I'm moved by them. Now that I've come to rest from so many thousands of words, numbered space, sorry, numbed space, named time, I stand at planet speed, struck dumb before such patiences as these that surge for years to crown in great calm altitudes in starful prongs. How did they get so far? They leave us to our babbling. They ignore the running reasons of the human stream. They pour into the sky. That's what they're standing for, for standing fast. They are a sign we shall not overcome except in undergoing more. I take some kind of pine to be at least in part McHugh's 
stunning reworking of the story of Apollo's pursuit of the nymph Daphne, who, according to Ovid, is transformed into, quote, the single splendor of the laurel tree. Mid-leap in her escape, the nymph is bushed. One hand bursts out in branches, tropes turn helio. The hapless god has suffered some comeuppance, too. He's stuck for good in his own stalking. Both parties are transformed. Apollo's pining, since it cannot be slaked, is the more devastating and, as I tell my children, never to say relatable of the two predicaments. In McHugh's retelling, his pining emblematizes him. Thus, he becomes a pine. A little later in the poem, we find Apollo, quote, downcast in the villa's living room, which, as sometimes happens to heroes in classical poetry, appears to be decorated with scenes from his own past. So now the downcast god puts forth forever in the villa's living room, preposterous, unsinkable, his best for member. There it is, a figurative branching toward her laurel literality. Figurative branches can't reach literal laurels, but the entire chase can be reenacted, reiterated over and over by, quote, putting forth a four-member. I think he's masturbating, which is to say, playing all parts in the myth and inhabiting for an instant all points in the chase. To feel those desires that set the assault in motion, he has to simultaneously remember and forget himself. This repeated action of self-forgetting, of remembering to forget, is, I think, essential to poetry, and nobody explores its cruel ratios as memorably as Heather McHugh. I'll leave you with one more poem, fittingly a poem I put here ahead of time so that I could look back to it. Writing these sentences last week, I remembered that McHugh has other versions of Apollo and Daphne, including what I perhaps fancifully take to be a very loose retelling. I'm Phil Fenstermacher in this story, but I've been on both sides of the pursuit. 2200 on 747. There is rain on the glass, but it all disappears when I look toward the curve on the world. The here and now is clear, I mean, so we can't see it. In an airplane, chance encounters always ask, so what are your poems about? They're about their business and their father's business and their monkey's uncle. They're about how nothing is about. They're not about about. This answer drives them back to the snack tray every time. Phil Fernstermacher, for example, turns up perfectly clear in my memory, perfectly attentive to his vache the saddest cheese. And now an interlude while we commiserate. It takes what might be years to open life's array of incidental parcels, mysteries of red strips, tips and strings, the tricks of tampons, lips of band-aids, perforated notches on detergent boxes, spatial reasoning milk carton quiz, (laughs) and subtle teleologies of toilet paper. Mr. Fernstermacher is relieved to fill his mind with the immediate and masterable challenge of the cheese. After his brief and chastening foray into the social arts... (laughs) We part before we part. Indeed, we part before we meet. I sense the French philosophers nearby. I hope not in the cockpit, undermining meaning as they do, or testing aerial translations three degrees. They think we are sunk. We are sunk in our little container, our story of starting and stopping. Just whose story is this anyway? Out of my mind, whose words emerge? Is there a self the self surpasses? Look at your glasses, someone whispers. Maybe the world is speckled by your carelessness and not its nature. Look at your glasses if you want to see. Who says, we're not alone? The town down there grows huge. One tiny runway will engulf us. 
Is the whisperer, Phil Fenstermacher, getting a last word in before the craft alights? I look at my glasses. I see what I mean. I see what he means. They're a sight. I just want to say that's all, but I, th this in the original does not appear slightly larger. That's the, the, the Q is not that type of poet. <laughs> um, anyway, thank you very much. And I, I don't know if one takes questions in this scenario, but I'm happy to if you have any. Thank you.